once a year, the city of Palma celebrates the birth of a man revered as a founding father of the modern Italian nation. He wasn't a king or a politician, but a composer. Today, musicians often pose as heroes, rebels and radicals, but in the 1800s, they truly were in the thick of the revolutions that were tearing up the map of Europe. In this volatile world, music reflected and even shaped events. This was the age of Verdi and Wagner, Beethoven, Schubert, Liszt, Rossini, Chopin, Mahler, Debussy. No other century produced more great composers. In this series, I'm exploring the extraordinary transformation that happened in the 19th century and discovering how music was at the front line of this changing world. This was the age when music and musicians burst out of the confines of the concert hall and onto the public stage, when a revolutionary song was said to be worth 10,000 soldiers and an opera could incite people to take to the streets and overthrow their government. In this film, I'll find out how music in the 19th century became charged with political significance. I feel like starting a revolution. From revolutionary France to Germany's search for nationhood and the Italian battle for independence. Composers didn't just talk about a revolution. They took to the barricades and wrote works that became musical cannonballs to fire into the fray. starts in Paris, city of culture, joie de vivre, and at the dawn of the 19th century, the bloody French Revolution. I've come here to find out how music was at the heart of a wave of insurgency which began here in the City of Light and then swept across Europe. Today, La Marseillaise embodies French solidarity, but it was born in the factional violence of the French Revolution. Written in Strasbourg in 1792 by a French army officer called Rouget de Lille, the song quickly made its way down to Marseille, where it caught on like wildfire, hence the name, the Marseillaise. There, it was belted out fervently by radicals and rebels as they made their way on the long march towards Paris to play their part in the bloodshed of the revolution. <laughs> to arms, citizens, form your battalions, La Marseillaise was sung by the revolutionaries as they stormed the royal palace. It may well have been ringing in Louis XVI's ears as his head was removed at the guillotine. The song rallied the French revolutionary army as it repelled foreign invaders. According to one army officer, La Marseillaise was worth 100,000 soldiers. In 1795, this hymn of violent revolution became the national anthem of the French Republic. The lyrics of the Marseillaise, celebrating citizens over tyrants, captured the essence of the French Revolution, that power resided with the people and not with the king. But it was more than just the words which made the song powerful. So given that there were a huge number of war songs, of protest songs, revolutionary songs, why was it the Marseillaise that stuck, that has stood the test of time? If you compare the Marseillaise with other songs of the time, the difference lies in the tune. It's the music that's good. It's the music that makes the difference. 
there's uh, this tremendous energy in the phrases and the repetition. Aux armes citoyens, formez vos bataillons. And citoyen is an important word also, because being a citizen is not being a subject. And there lies the difference. If you sing it on your own, it, it sounds totally ri ridiculous. If you sing it well, it's better. If you, if you are part of a crowd, then, then there's this sense of belonging together with, with people around you and being part of a fraternity, as they say in the, said in the revolution. The Marseillaise had demonstrated the power of music to motivate the masses. Victor Hugo, the most famous French author of the age, sums up that power in his novel Les Miserables. It is thanks to the little man of Paris that the revolution conquered. He delights in song. Give him the Marseillaise and he will liberate the world. It wasn't only the little man of Paris that it roused. Just as the French Revolution inspired rebels and radicals well beyond France, so La Marseillaise became the revolutionary song of 19th century Europe. It carried the message that ordinary citizens could rise up and challenge tyranny. and Europe's leaders were rightly petrified of music's potential to upset the status quo. When Napoleon came to power, he introduced a new civil code of law, forbidding privileges based on birth, allowing freedom of religious worship, encouraging government jobs to go to those best suited to them. So far, so good. But he also imposed strict censorship on theatres, on the press and on music. On Napoleon's hit list was the Marseillaise. He understood its revolutionary power and set about replacing it with this rather less rousing hymn. Originally the revolutionary people's hero, Napoleon had shown himself to be as tyrannical as the old monarchy. Open opposition to his regime was a dangerous business, so protesters disguised their political messages in subversive ballads and songs. One of the most popular was a thinly veiled satire of Napoleon called the King of Yveto, apparently a real rabble rouser on the streets of Paris at the time. Let's do it. OK. <laughs> Like a dog. So I have to be a revolutionary yes. menacing dog. It's terrible. OK, it's the, mm. the revolution on the streets. OK, it might not sound like political dynamite to our ears, but by praising a good little king who travels round the country by donkey and thirsts for wine, not conquest. This song was very much a two-fingered salute to the power-hungry Napoleon. It's a very jolly, happy little song. Yes, it is happy and at the same time very revolutionary. Why? Very What's going on? Harsh, very... En fait, c'est on profite, on prend un, un roi très vieux, un roi fainéant. Yes, on aimait just step back to the uh, lazy king, a uh, lazy king. So you have this lazy king, this fictionalized historical yes. figure sitting in bed with his cotton yeah, little bonnet cotton on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why did people think of Napoleon when they heard this song? I think there is a substitution, une substitution mm -hmm. of the figure of Napoleon 
um, and this, this fictional yes, king fictional in history. King. So this is Béranger making fun of the most powerful man in France, yes. Napoleon. Yes, it is very dangerous. And la dernière. Oh, okay. I'm vraiment very, very happy. On conserve encore le portrait de ce digne bon prince. C'est l'enseigne d'un cabaret fameux dans la province. Les jours de fête, bien souvent, la foule s'écrit en buvant de bon. Quel mon petit roi, c'était là, là. Quel mon petit roi, c'était là. Yes. I feel like starting a revolution. The King of Yvetot was a huge hit in Napoleonic France and it made its writer a star. Pierre-Jean de Béranger was a former banker and university clerk who became a thorn in the side of tyrants and kings. But ironically, he started out in the pay of the Bonaparte family. Béranger grew up during the French Revolution. He even witnessed the storming of the Bastille as a child. Originally from a poor family, his financial situation was drastically improved when he was given a thousand francs by Bonaparte's brother, Lucien, so that he composed songs for him. But Béranger was a man of the people. He simply couldn't help himself. Béranger's satires were perfectly timed. Shortly after he dared to mock the emperor, Napoleon was ousted from power after his defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. But to Béranger's horror, all the victorious allies did was restore the monarchy to the throne. For the French people, it was a case of plus à change. And it was the people Béranger stood for. He turned his fire on the new regime, attacking corrupt officials, the church, even the king. The people loved him for it. His songs flourished in the bars and cafes of Paris. The authorities tried to clamp down, and Béranger was jailed for offence to public and religious morality. But all it did was boost his anti-establishment credentials and his popularity. Béranger's genius was that he got the power of music as a universal language. When so many people were illiterate, putting his words together with popular tunes of the day caused a sensation. Béranger said that there was a need for a man who spoke to the people in a language they understood and loved. I was that man. Béranger was the founding father of the modern protest song. His talent for addressing the big issues of the day paved the way for 20th century musicians like Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. But it wasn't just the songs of the street that acted as political weapons. In the 19th century, even the most rarefied music could inspire revolution. Today, an opera house might seem like the most refined, genteel place on earth, but in post-revolutionary France, these were places of intrigue and politics, even sometimes sedition. In the 1820s, opera was big business, the Hollywood of its day. Promoters were desperate to cater for the growing power base in society, the middle classes but they had to walk a careful line, giving audiences the exciting stories they craved while censoring revolutionary themes, which were often the most popular. So they came up with a solution. The establishment instead encouraged a new form of opera, grand opera, featuring lavish sets and staging and centered round historical stories that were far removed from the difficulties of contemporary politics. 
in 1828, the first major grand opera made its debut in Paris, La Mouette de Portici, the mute girl of Portici. Composed by Daniel Aubert, this was opera as epic spectacle, complete with huge crowd scenes and special effects. It told the story of a heroic young fisherman who starts a revolution, and it climaxed with an exploding volcano. <laughs> La Mouette de Portici was intended as lavish entertainment for the middle classes. It ended up becoming part of not only musical, but revolutionary history. And it proved you never can second-guess an audience. So it was political, it was historical, it was a love story, it had an exploding volcano, what's not to love? <laughs> That's right. No wonder it was so popular. <laughs> but this is a really sensitive time. So if this is a story about revolution, why did the censors pass it? It's a good question. Um, they were only interested in the text and the libretto, and essentially it's a safe story because the revolution fails at the end, and it's set in distant time and distant place geographically. Um, but of course, they didn't bank on the visual dimension and the music. And there's a particular number in the opera sung by Massaniello, the revolutionary leader, and his comrade Piero, where they um, decide they're going to start the uprising. So this duet has a line from the Marseillaise, Amour sacré de la patrie. Amour sacré de la patrie. Grand... Sacred love for the fatherland. Yes, exactly. And you can see it's peppered with uh, words like gloire, victoire, um, very sort of resonant stories. It's better to be dead uh, than to be slaves. So it borrows a bit of the tune of the Marseillaise, the words of the Marseillaise, protest songs from the street that people would have known, and it scoops all of that up and takes it into the opera house. Exactly. <laughs> The music of La Mouette wasn't confined to the opera house. It spilled out into the streets, played by barrel organists and loved by the public. At a time when opposition to the monarchy was reaching boiling point, the rousing duet became a popular hit. We are dancing on a volcano, said one French courtier. In July 1830, the volcano erupted, not just the one on the stage, but now on the streets, as a new revolution broke out in Paris. The unpopular king was replaced with a more pliable constitutional monarch, and La Mouette now took on an even greater significance. This poster shows us the first performance after the July Revolution at the opera of La Muette, where they just played the first four acts, so they didn't play the fifth act, where the revolution is put down. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an opera about a successful revolution. And it was given for the benefit of widows and injured from the, the July Revolution. So they actually changed the end of the opera to suit what was unfolding daily in front of them. That's right. And then the opera goes to Belgium, where it really does spark a revolution. Exactly. And this was the song that reputedly sparked the, the Belgian revolution. It was this particular number that, that was chosen. In August 1830, a month after the revolution in Paris, rebels in Belgium chose a performance of La Mouette de Portici to start a successful uprising of their own, overthrowing their Dutch rulers. The composer Richard Wagner later said, seldom has an artistic product stood in closer connection with a world event. During the 19th century, the revolutionary waves which had started in Paris rippled throughout Europe. In Poland in November 1830, inspired by the revolutions in France and Belgium, Polish nationalists rose up against foreign occupation. But their revolt was brutally crushed 
and thousands of Poles were driven into exile. Following the defeat, one composer above all came to embody the Polish spirit in music and his people's longing for a free homeland, Frédéric Chopin. Chopin wasn't a revolutionary, but he was a casualty of the insurrection and turmoil that was sweeping across Europe in the 1830s. One of many leading lights who fled from Poland, which was then under a repressive Russian regime. And he remained a fervent patriot for the rest of his life, but he never went back to his homeland, instead carrying with him a jar of precious Polish soil to Paris, where he stayed for the rest of his life. Like his precious jar of earth, Chopin always carried that yearning for his homeland with him in exile. And he embedded it in his music. Mining a rich tradition of Polish national dances, like the mazurka and the polonaise, Chopin transformed his longing for Poland into sound. It's a fantastic piece, it's so bouncy, it's got great energy to it, but what makes it Polish? Well, I think it's to do with the characterization of the third beat. Um, the rhythm is very, very close to a waltz with the same um pa pa, but it should have a very sharply um, snapped third beat. Just so, show me what you mean then. What do I have to do? So it's not just a straight one, two, three, one, two, three. Yes. OK, so yeah. that's what gives it its Polish kind of it's kick. A, it's a kick, and in this particular mazurka, a swagger. So you've got this kind of snap, this pulse to the rhythm. What was it that Chopin was getting at with that sense of Polishness in his music? It was something that was very, very important to him, and, of course, Poland at that time didn't have sovereignty. It had been absorbed by um, wicked neighbours so to speak, and um, it was a way of asserting an identity that would have appealed to the diaspora of Poles who were living in different parts of Europe at that time. So in that sense, his Polish dances are quite political. And how much did that chime with them, his music? Well, I think a very great deal. Um, and it's clear that the mazurka, he wrote many, many, many of them in different styles. They were very, very important to him. And they seemed to encapsulate his own feelings of longing and displacement. So there's one mazurka in particular where it keeps breaking off and you're just left with one solitary voice here, disembodied. There's the sense of loneliness and displacement which he's actually written into the music. Out. It does, because it takes you away from anywhere secure. This is music, ultimately, of insecurity. And I think in the mazurkas, particularly, Chopin does this a lot. And for me, at least, I understand that as Chopin telling us that he is displaced and his people are displaced. Chopin's heart-rending music had the power to create nostalgia, that sense of a homeland and the torture of not being able to return there. But in death, at least, the exile was reclaimed by his nation. When Chopin died, he was buried in Paris, but his heart was taken back by his sister to Warsaw. There, it was pickled in cognac, preserved in an urn, and buried inside a pillar in the Church of the Holy Cross. France could have his body, but Poland would always own Chopin's heart. 
Chopin did not liberate his people. But he did show how music could be not just beautiful, but also powerfully political. No wonder the composer Robert Schumann described Chopin's music as cannons buried in flowers. Music had become a potent force, not only in inspiring revolution, but in fostering identity and nationhood. And it would play a crucial role in the building of new nation states. In the early 19th century, Germany was a collection of small but separate states. There was a rising tide in favor of uniting the German peoples in a single nation. In the land that had produced Beethoven and Bach, it was natural that a unifying symbol should emerge from music. And it did in an opera, Der Freischutz, by the German composer Karl Maria von Weber. Weber wanted to create a new kind of opera free from French and Italian influence. And so he wrote Def Heischer's The Free Shooter in German and with exactly the kind of storyline that his German-speaking audience would instantly recognize. After all, they'd grown up on Cinderella, Rumpelstiltskin, Hansel and Gretel, those tales of dark German forests and ghouls and ghostly pacts. And so Def Heischer tells exactly one of those stories we have. Boy meets girl, they fall madly in love, only he has to prove himself by shooting brilliantly in a marksman's competition. Things do not go well, and so our hero retreats into the forest, scores some magic bullets, and goes back hoping to win his beloved's hand. Only, ugh, it nearly goes pear-shaped and he almost shoots her, but in the end they live happily ever after, and the baddies all go to hell. Phew. Der Freischutz opened during a craze for all things gothic. It came in the wake of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and the first vampire novels. And the supernatural horror of this opera thrilled crowds across Europe. But most of all, it struck a deep chord with German audiences who heard in it a recognizable sound of nationhood. So how did Weber create that sense of Germanness in music? Isn't that gorgeous? It's just that, to me, instantly sets up Freischutz as this lovely, comforting world. I mean, this is the first few bars of the overture, the opening of the opera, and it's those gorgeous, lilting strings, lovely horns. It sets up this idea of a German mythology, um, which is one of the things that Freischutz absolutely sets out to do, to set up this idea of, um, of what the good Germany is, um, and, you, and you have to remember that the, the idea of Germany was something that was gradually coalescing at the time. And this is also an attempt to, to manufacture, if you like, a, a, a German identity. So you have the woods and you have the hunters. And, you ha and, and this is all in the horns. This is, a, this is an instrument that's associated with hunters in the wood. Um, it's outdoorsy. It's, it's beautiful and, and lovely. So you set up this idea of a lovely, lilting, German, folkloric, woods-money place, and immediately he brings in this much darker chord, which is this.
It's the classic, I mean, it's become the classic horror movie chord. Exactly. This is the diminished seventh chord, which is short enough for scary. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm petrified! Exactly, and it's great for invoking these ideas or evoking these ideas of the supernatural or otherness. And, of course, this is the chord that uh, Weber very specifically attaches to the body of the piece, to the evil spirit Samuel, who lives in the Wolf's Glen. It's a way of psychologically manipulating the audience, and that's a, that's a revolutionary thing to do. How does Weber achieve that kind of atmosphere musically? Well, he does it using a technique that over a century later film composers discover, which is he's not doing very much. He's <laughs> using just very, very quiet strings, and he's got a little wispy flute line which just rises and you just sense something's going to kick off soon. He's sort of cranking up the tension. Exactly. We don't see the demon, but we know he's there because of the music. <laughs> on like that and Faber gradually adds more instruments to the orchestra he changes the tempo he makes it faster he makes it louder and it's a masterpiece of just gradually pacing a scene of increasing tension Before we've had natural storms, we've had dark places, but the Wolf's Glen scene is, is one of the first places where it's actually imbued with this emotion of fear and of, 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 of evil. And what a brilliant contrast, then, with that perfect, rural, idyllic Germany and the otherly alien outsider. You're a German, you belong to us, you're part of this lovely world, or you're in this dark place. Yeah, and look how that developed throughout the 19th century. Weber's vision proved to be an inspiration for one emerging German composer whose complex genius still resonates today, Richard Wagner. Oh, my magnificent German fatherland, Wagner wrote ecstatically about Weber's opera. How must I love thee, if for no other reason than that Der Freischutz rose from thy soil, how happy I am to be German. Following in Weber's footsteps, Wagner believed that German nationhood could be best expressed through art rooted in national myth and legend. But for true German art to flourish, he believed society itself needed to be transformed. In 1848, the revolutionary wave that was sweeping across Europe hit Germany, and Wagner saw his chance. At the time, he was working as the music director at the Royal Saxon Court in Dresden. But in May 1849, he gave up the prestigious job and instead became an out-and-out -out revolutionary, one of the leaders of an anti-royalist uprising in the city. When revolution broke out on the streets of Dresden, Wagner threw himself eagerly into the fray. He'd already hosted political meetings at his house, but now he was ready to get his hands dirty with the business of insurrection, manning the barricades and even making hand grenades. The Dresden police issued this warrant for his arrest, describing Wagner as 37 to 38 years old, middling height, brown hair with glasses. Could have been anybody really which is why wagner escaped fleeing on a false passport into exile in switzerland mm. 
Wagner had a narrow escape. The uprising failed. Many of his revolutionary accomplices were arrested and imprisoned. One even received a death sentence. It would be 12 years before Wagner could return to his homeland. As the dust of the Dresden Revolution settled, Wagner spent his years of exile deep in thought. Perhaps violent uprising wasn't the answer. Maybe his composer's pen would prove to be mightier than the sword. So he put down the guns and instead picked up the books. Wagner wasn't just a composer. He was a true thinker and intellectual. This is his vast library, just part of an enormous collection of books, and it shows us a voracious reader, particularly of philosophy. Nietzsche, Kant, Hegel, all of them fueled Wagner's desire for a socialist utopia. Inspired by his studies, Wagner decided he was the man to build utopia on Earth. He set out on a revolutionary mission of extraordinary ambition to redeem corrupt humanity, as he saw it, through the power of his own art. He would bring together music, words, costume, lighting, scenery, a feast for all the senses that would overwhelm his audience, bringing them to a new state of enlightenment. And for these total artworks to have their full redemptive impact, Wagner decided he needed a special performance space, free from the distractions of the wider world. He chose not an urban centre like Munich or Berlin, but the remote town of Bayreuth in Upper Bavaria. Today, Bayreuth is Wagner town. His likeness is everywhere. The key building is not in the town centre, but perched high above on a hill the Festspielhaus, Wagner's festival house, where every detail was built to his exacting specifications to showcase his music and provide a transcendent experience, if not a comfortable one. People wait for years to get hold of tickets for this place, despite the fact that it's a byword for discomfort. There are no armrests, virtually no padding on the hard wooden seats, certainly no air conditioning in the stifling hot Bayreuth summers. And once you're in, you are in it for the long haul. Six or so hours of bottom-numbing entertainment. Legend has it that if you die during a performance here, as people have done, no one's going to call an ambulance until the interval. It's all about the music at the house that Wagner built. Wagner made all sorts of new theatrical innovations. Nothing is allowed to get in the way of what's happening on stage. Even the orchestra's hidden in a specially designed sunken pit. The wooden walls and ceiling improved the acoustics. Everyone here got an equally good view. Unlike the Paris Opera, the house lights were dimmed as the music started. After all, you were here to see the performance, not to be seen. is part theatre, part temple, a sacred space dedicated to the transformative power of Wagner's total artworks. After five years of planning, 
the first Bayreuth Festival opened in the summer of 1876. Just a few years earlier, Wagner had been a wanted man, chased out of his homeland as a traitor. Now he was fawned on by the crowned heads of Europe, including the German emperor, Wilhelm I. Through the power of his music and the scale of his ambition, Wagner had transformed the role of the artist in society. He wrote, though it was not unknown for an artist to be summoned before an emperor and princes, no one could recall that an emperor and princes had ever come to him. Today, people still travel from across the globe in their thousands to this remote temple to experience Wagner's music as he intended it. Wagner lived to see Germany unified in the 1870s. But he had set his sights on a revolutionary musical mission that transcended borders. Had his ambition to redeem humanity been a success? Here we are in the Great Hall, and there he is, Richard Wagner, his bust at least. So Wagner is a man who conceives of a better society, tries in some way to bring yes. that about through yes. his operas. How much would you say he was successful in that aim? Um, he certainly was not successful in the sense that he made a specific society change or anything like that, but he was probably very successful in the sense that his art is still very relevant until today. So I think in that sense, they were successful. He's as much a mm -hmm. writer as he is a composer, mm -hmm. and he commits himself to all sorts of yes. views. Very virulent anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. How much is he then an easy figure to make sense of? Yes, he's certainly not an easy figure, um, but he's also representative of the 19th century, a child of his time, I think. Wagner created lasting musical monuments and a powerful cult of personality that lives on today. But despite his attempts, his music didn't achieve universal enlightenment or transform German society. Ironically, it was a composer with little interest in politics, born 500 miles to the south of Germany in 1813, the very same year as Wagner, who would become one of the great heroes of 19th century nationalism. Like Wagner in Germany, this composer grew up in an Italy that didn't yet exist on the map. Instead, it was a collection of small states dominated by foreign powers and its people yearned for unity and independence. They found their inspiration in the great opera composer, Giuseppe Verdi. Today, Verdi is still honored for his political legacy in Italy. To find out more, I've come to his home region of Parma, where I've gained access to one of Italy's most exclusive clubs. with only 27 members. To join, not only do you have to be invited, you have to wait for someone else to die. Today, 
the club is celebrating the 202nd anniversary of the birth of their hero. By singing Verdi's anthem to freedom, Va Pensiero, from his opera Nabucco. Grazie, grazie mille. Benvenuta al Club dei 27. Grazie. Io sono presidente. Un giorno di regno. Un giorno di regno. Each member takes the name of one of Verdi's 27 operas, whichever one happens to be vacant. Fabio Macbeth. Macbeth, Susie. Falstaff. Buongiorno, thank you. Nicandro Nabucco. Nabucco, OK. Angelo Traviata. Chiamo Susie. Piacere, Pier. Stefano Aida. Oh, hello, Aida. Good to meet you. I can't help noticing there's rather a shortage of women here. Unless you count La Traviata and Aida, of course. Thank you so much for having me here. Stefano, can you tell me, does Verdi to you feel like the sound of Italy? Does he feel very Italian? And why? Penso perché è proprio eh, nell'animo nell de degli italiani. Noi siamo un popolo latino, molto caldo, quindi eh, è, è proprio dentro il nostro DNA, in, in the DNA. It's that hot Latin kind of anima, spirit, esatto. in your DNA. Esatto, esatto, esatto. Verdi ha interpretato tutti i sentimenti dell'animo umano, da, dall'amore all'odio, alla rabbia, alla gelosia. Jealousy, e love, hatred. Yeah. Tutti i sentimenti dell'animo umano. It's not exactly the Illuminati, but there is one secret. The lurid drinks, so coloured in honour of Verdi, a composer whose name in English is Joseph Green. Oh, secret. 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 secret recipe. È forte? No. No. Acqua, acqua, solo acqua. It's only water. Viva Verdi! Viva Verdi! Viva Verdi! Viva Verdi. Viva Verdi. Oh, that's not water. <laughs> the club of the 27 aren't the only Italians to revere Verdi. The Vapensiero chorus has become almost a second national anthem in Italy. But this music was very nearly not composed at all. It was born of the darkest moment in Verdi's life. By the time he was 27 years old, Verdi had lost his young wife and two infant children to sudden death from disease. Thrown into depression, he resolved to give up composing. But fortune intervened. Verdi was offered the chance to write a new opera, telling the biblical story of the exile of the Jews from their homeland. Initially, he refused, said he wasn't interested, but he did take the book home, and he later said he threw it down on his desk and one page opened, the words leapt out at him, va pensiero sull'ali dorate. One line of the poetry in particular fired his imagination. It read, O oh, mia patria, si bella e perduta, O oh, my homeland, so beautiful and lost. Verdi was captivated and his opera Nabucco was born. The premiere of Nabucco took place here at La Scala in Milan on the 9th of March, 1842. Verdi was so nervous that when the first ovation erupted, he thought it was a cheer of derision. He needn't have worried. The opera was an instant triumph. At the moment when Italians were most desperately craving their own Italy, an opera telling the story of an oppressed people yearning to find their place in the world was bound to be a surefire hit. Verdi himself admitted that Nabucco had been born under a lucky star.
Verdi was convinced that Italy could only flourish if it was both unified and free from foreign control. And in 1848, as revolution broke out across Europe, he believed Italy's moment to throw off foreign occupation had finally come. Honour to all of Italy, he wrote. The hour of her liberation is here. There cannot be any music welcomed to Italian ears in 1848 except the music of the cannon. But it was the foreign cannons that prevailed and Italian hopes were ruthlessly dashed. The revolutions might have failed, but Verdi's career soared to new heights. He had a genius for putting into music the passions and frailties of human life, stories of real people, far from the gods and monsters of somebody like Richard Wagner. Verdi's success with operas such as Rigoletto and La Traviata made him rich, enough to buy this vast estate in the Palmer countryside. He was here when, in 1859, a new war of liberation broke out and the fighting reached almost to the borders of his land. Verdi was hardly a brother in arms, though. He spent many of the revolutionary years here at his lavish estate doing up his des res. The only action these guns ever saw was on one of his many hunting trips, shooting ducks. Unlike Wagner, Verdi wasn't an active revolutionary who manned the barricades and spent his evenings fashioning hand grenades. His weapons were the pen and the baton. And in a final twist of fortune, even his name. Now, he'd been a supporter of Victor Emmanuel, the man who was front-runner to become king if and when Italy was unified. So when Viva Verdi was scrawled on walls everywhere, it had a double meaning. Yes, it was a celebration of the composer, but it also read, Viva, long live Vittorio Emanuele, re di Italia, Victor Emmanuel, king of Italy. And in 1861, an independent Italy was finally declared, with King Victor Emmanuel crowned head of the new nation. To find out how history and a dose of good luck were on Verdi's side, I've come to the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan. Started in the 1860s to celebrate the new Italy and named after its first king, it was designed to link, symbolically, the two most important buildings in the city, the Opera House and the Cathedral. How much is Verdi intentionally injecting a kind of national Italian flavour into his music, and how much is that just a question of the fact that the audience desperately wanted to hear something Italian? I think it's both. He is willing to put in his operas music that is stirring, that is about building of nations, uniting of people, political discourse, but also the audience was particularly attuned to what might transpire in his operas. So how willing a participant is Verdi in this sort of groundswell, this tidal wave of nationalism? He definitely was a willing participant. He knew that he was so famous that people listened to him. He didn't say much, but he was there when it mattered. He was there particularly in those crucial years, 1859, 1860, 1861, when most of Italy was unified. So Verdi is a genius composer, I mean, there's no doubt about that. But how much do you also think it's true that he's just lucky? He comes about as Italy needs a massive hero. Absolutely, that's exactly what he is. He comes about at the right time and is the right man for the job. He's the most famous Italian artist and the nation needs him to build itself. And he knows it and he runs with it. He definitely runs with it. Verdi was there 
just when Italy most needed a unifying cultural symbol to bring the nation together. It's something the Italian people have never forgotten. At the annual festival to celebrate Verdi's music held here in Parma, the centerpiece is a chorus of Va Pensiero. That anthem of national belonging sung from one generation to the next since Verdi's time. Verdi's music had helped to forge modern Italy. It remains to this day a symbol of the best of Italian culture. In the 19th century, music had played a vital role in the surge of nationalism and revolution that forged modern Europe. It bound together the citizens of new nations like Italy and Germany, and it helped heal the old wounds of revolution in countries such as France. And at the century's end, as Europe moved from an age of violent uprising to one of global commerce and empire, in place of the slogans of revolution or death, now came national pride and stability. In 1889, Paris marked the 100-year anniversary of the French Revolution with a huge international exhibition. The Eiffel Tower was the centerpiece, and there were rousing renditions of the Marseillaise. Once banned as dangerously subversive, it was now restored as France's national hymn. The Marseillaise was no longer the musical equivalent of a Molotov cocktail, an incitement to revolution. Now it was the proudly patriotic anthem of the new France, a country eager to take its place on the modern international stage. In the final episode, I'll discover how music was at the forefront of another great revolution. The sweeping transformation of technology. With new industrially manufactured instruments and futuristic ways of listening. Mm -hmm.